Well, the past two weeks have been very interesting uh, for those who have been watching the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. Um, have any of you been following the, the conventions? See uh, a number of hands going up. Uh, let me ask this, have any of you made up your minds who you're going to be voting for? See, this, this is the poll. See, this is going to be announced on CNN tonight. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I like to know what's going on in, in our country. I, I've been watching both uh, the Democratic and the National, uh, Democratic National Conventions. But, you know, oftentimes uh, you get very different opinions and you get very different perspectives of our country depending on which convention you're watching and uh, which news station you, you watch. But you know, as we uh, head into the presidential elections this November, you know, one thing that uh, I think we can agree on is that we are in na a nation that is in need of prayer. In fact, God's word tells us to pray for our nation. During our, our pastoral prayer this morning, we, we prayed for our president. We prayed for our nation's leaders. And that's what uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter one, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And this is, these are the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, I urge then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peace and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So the Apostle Paul was saying that we need to be praying for those who are in authority. Now, in our day and age, we don't have kings, we don't have emperors, as they did at the time that the Apostle Paul wrote this, but we do need to be praying for those in authority for our president, our nation's leaders. We need to be praying for the upcoming election, and we need to be praying about the issues that lie before us as a nation. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think that America is in need of prayer? You know, let me read to you uh, the very first National Day of Prayer proclamation that was given by one of our nation's greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln. And he wrote this in April of 1863. We have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. And then he says this, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Well, I believe that these words that were spoken by Abraham Lincoln in April of 1863 are just as relevant to us as a nation here in 2016. Do you think that America is in need of examining our own hearts and lives before a holy and righteous God? And do you believe that our nation is in need of a spiritual reawakening? that we are in need of a spiritual revival. And I agree with the words of Abraham Lincoln that we are a nation that so often forgets God. We are, as a nation, seem to be moving farther and farther away from biblical truth. But it's not only our nation. The church also has forgotten about God and obeying his commandments. We are a nation that so often calls good evil and evil good. And I like the words that Ezra wrote in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Now these are, are God's words that he gave to, to Ezra. And this is what the Lord says. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
in my opinion, that as a nation, we are in need of a, of a gracious healing by God. We are in need of a spiritual reawakening. As a nation, we do not love God as we should, and we do not love one another as the Bible commands us to. We are a nation that's divided over our politics. We are a nation divided over race, over the economy, how to deal with terrorism, and so many other issues that lie before us as a nation. And even in the church, there are people who don't always agree and see things eye to eye. When I served at my former church uh, in Southern California, we had very different perspectives, some people on different issues that you find in scripture. One had to deal with, with baptism. People that came to Wintersburg came from all different uh, types of backgrounds, and some believed in, as the Presbyterian Church believed in infant baptism, but other believed in, in believer's baptism, that you're not baptized until you accept Christ into your heart as your Savior and Lord. Some of the other issues that we dealt with were, were women in ministry. Should women be allowed to, to be pastors and, and leaders? Uh, I, I affirm that. But in some churches, they, they firmly uh, believe that women should not have a voice in leadership in the church. Other people have differences of agreements about whether uh, same-sex marriages should be allowed in the church or supporting the LGBTQ uh, movement. And there are so many other issues that take place within uh, the context of the authority of scripture that lead people uh, to see things differently. But you know, we are often tempted to think that because of the moral and spiritual state of our nation, and even in our church, that that might be one of the reasons why we're failing to see a, a spiritual reawakening in our country today. How many of you have family or friends that don't go to a church on a regular basis? How many of you have family or friends that you know of don't uh, worship God, don't read the Bible, don't pray to God, and are not growing as followers and disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet, if you were to study church history, you would discover that it is often during the, the darkest times of sin and depravity in a nation that the groundwork for a revival was established. And that is what we see in this morning's passage of scripture as we continue on to study the book of Jonah. Now the book of Jonah was written about 760 B.C. And as I, I mentioned uh, uh, several weeks ago as we began our study in the book of Jonah, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Nineveh is the present day Mosul that we see on TV as we follow news about what is taking place in Iraq. Now, one of the things that I mentioned before was that the Assyrians were legendary for their cruelty. I mentioned before that archaeologists have found a huge library of over 10,000 tablets an ancient, in an ancient uh, library in Nineveh, where among the, the things that Nineveh boasted about were the, the creative ways that they discovered how to kill and torture people. In fact, it had a, a reputation of being a very nasty and a very cruel city. It was the Assyrian policy uh, to never keep the prisoners of war alive. They gloated over the victims and, and uh, enjoyed uh, committing atrocities. They would hold their victim, victims down and cut out their tongues. They would skin their victims alive and they built pyramids of the human skulls of those people that, that they had killed and for the cities that they conquered. And so the city of Nineveh was a very cruel and wicked city, and their reputation was known throughout the then known world. This was a city that was filled with sin and depravity. And so when God calls Jonah to go and tell the people of Nineveh to repent, what we are seeing is the heart of God, the reaching out of God's heart, trying to express to even these, these people who are far from him, that he loves them with an everlasting love. Even the heathen Gentiles who were so depraved, God's heart, God's concern was for them. And so as we looked at last week, after Jonah had rebelled and ran from God, being swallowed by a great fish, Jonah 3.1 tells us that the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And as we talked about last week, our God is a God of second chances, even 
third chances. God is a God who never gives up trying to speak to our hearts, trying to restore our relationship with him. And so as we pick up the story of Jonah this morning, beginning in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, we see these words. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, as I mentioned last week, in the English language, uh, though there are eight words that God commanded Jonah to speak. In the Hebrew language, there are only five words. And so briefly, I want to share with you four lessons that we can learn uh, about how we can usher in a revival taken from the words of Jonah this morning. Now, again, if you remember from my previous messages, God had given Jonah two imperatives. The first imperative was that he was to go, and the second imperative was that he was to go and preach. God told Jonah in Jonah chapter 3, verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give to you. And according to verse 4, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day, and then he cried out, this was the message, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overturned. Now, the way that it appears in the the Hebrew text, the emphasis is on the word I. This was not to be Jonah's message, but this was God's message to the people of Nineveh. It's like the Lord was saying, I will give you the message. I is the most important word in in this sentence. He says, I will tell you what to tell the people of Nineveh. And so Jonah faithfully proclaimed the message that God had given to him. But not only was there a faithful proclamation of God's message, but the people of Nineveh heard that and they obeyed. So the second step on the road to revival is a belief in God. A belief in God. Verse 5 begins by saying, The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, Put on sackcloth. Here, Scripture tells us that the word was faithfully proclaimed. The Ninevites heard the word of God, and they believed the word of God. Now, do you notice that Jonah doesn't say uh, that the people believed his preaching? He says that they believed God. They heard of the word of the Lord. They believed it, and they obeyed it. And the the word believed here is the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where it says, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he he accounted it to him for righteousness. This isn't just a a believing what Jonah said. It's trusting the God who has spoken. The people believed that Jonah's message was God's message. So they believed God, and they responded to God's message. They just didn't hear God's word. They believed God's word. They responded to God's word, and it affected their lives. Remember last year when we were studying the the book of James? One of the verses that we looked at was James chapter 1, verse 22, where James wrote, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Charles Colson, who says, what good is it to have beliefs if you're not going to live by them? And that's what James is saying here. We're just not to hear God's word, but we are to act. We are to obey God's word. Jesus said in John 13, 17, he said, now that you know these things, now that you've been taught these things, Jesus said, you will be blessed if you do them or if you obey them. And that's what Jonah is trying to teach us here that the road to revival comes about through a belief in God. And it's just not knowing about God, but it's taking God for who he is, that he is the God of love, that he is a God who loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins and to offer us forgiveness and eternal life. Our closing hymn this morning is is a great hymn of the Christian faith, Trust and Obey. And in those words, it's trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And that's what Jonah is saying here. Believe in God. Take God as his word and then obey. 
Romans 10, 9 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And that's how salvation comes about. It's not because we know a lot of facts about God, but it's because we've taken what God has said in his word and that we have taken God seriously and we've applied that word to our lives. So this is what the Ninevites did. They believed in God and they were saved. The third step on the road to revival in Nineveh was action upon that belief. And in verses 6 and 7, this is what Jonah writes. He says, When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let any man or beast herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. Again, we see that they heard the word of the Lord, and then they acted upon the word. Verse 5 tells us they declared a fast, all of them, from the greatest to the least. And the response was unanimous as a people, from the lowest of the low, from the lower classes, all the way up to the upper classes. And as people began to, to see that the word of God was speaking to their hearts, the word eventually reached the king. And the city's repentance was, was, was underway because the king came to faith. And then everybody else in that city began to comply. So it was a, a city-wide repentance. And then the fourth thing that we see here is that in Nineveh, there was a, a turning away from sin. Now, the word that we commonly hear when talking about turning away from sin is the word repentance. And that was the, the very first message that Jesus gave. As Jesus came into to Galilee, it tells us that he came re teaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. But let me ask you this question. What is repentance? What does it mean to repent? You know, I think that there's some confusion as to what repentance really is. Some people think that repentance is being sorry for their sins. But that is remorse. Remorse can lead to repentance, but it's not repentance. In the Bible, it tells us the story of the rich young ruler who had so much wealth, and he, he came to Jesus, and he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And the Lord told this rich young ruler, give everything you have to the poor and then come and follow me. And in that story, we see remorse, but we don't see a change of heart. We don't see any repentance. We see that the, the rich young ruler was sorry for his sins, but there was no change in his life. Others think that repentance means that we regret something that, that we have done. Pontius Pilate the word of God tells us, regretted his decision concerning Jesus, but he never repented of it. He regretted it, but he didn't repent. And some people think that repentance is the same thing as having a, a strong resolve, that I'm going to do better in the future. And although that may lead to repentance, it's not quite there yet. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. Meta as in metaphys metaphysics, meaning to change, and noia, meaning thinking. Or, so the way that we get our, our word, English word knowledge, noia, metanoia, change of, of thinking. Repentance is a change of thinking, which results ultimately in a change of action. And this is what we see taking place in the lives of the Ninevites. I remember uh, years ago when I was at my first church in, in Hollywood, we, we had gone to uh, Shaver Lake, up uh, just north of Fresno, and there, there was a, a, a guy who was going with us, and, and he took the wrong road. And he had gone a long way, maybe about a half hour the wrong way, and he recognized that he was on the wrong road, and he had to turn around and come back. And that's what repentance is. We're going one way, we're going on the wrong direction, and then when we recognize that, we turn around and we make a hundred an 80 degree turn. We're turning from sin and we're turning towards God. And so that's what we see in the lives of Nineveh. They were repenting. They were turning towards God. In verse 8, this, these are the words of the king. But let the man and beast be covered with sackcloth 
Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And you see, that's what happens when we begin to pray for our nation's leaders. They began to pray for repentance. God's word spoke to the heart of the king. The king's heart was moved, and the king told everyone that they should urgently begin to call on God. And then it tells us that everyone began to turn from their evil and wicked ways. And so we are a nation that is in need of praying for our nation's leaders. And then in verse 9, the king offers the possibility of hope in God's compassion. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn his, from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And so like Jonah is saying here, the people of Nineveh have been so far from God, and yet God is good. God is gracious. God is a God of compassion. And God demonstrated his compassion upon the people of Nineveh who were so evil and wicked, but God's heart touched their hearts and lives. People began to turn. God relented from the judgment that he was going to bring upon them, and it sparked a true revival. And then finally, verse 10 gives us the conclusion of the matter. When God saw what they had did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. And so some people might have said that the, the nation or, the, or the, the city of Nineveh was so far from God beyond anything that God can do because they were so evil and wicked. But we see the heart of God reaching out. And every time you read in the Old Testament, you read from the prophets, there are four major themes that you would find in every book of prophecy. One is the reaching out of the heart of God. God trying to tell the people that I love you. The second thing that you see in the prophets is that of rebellion, the sinfulness of the human heart. God is reaching out to the people saying, I love you. But we also see the, the, the stubborn rebelliousness of the human heart. Third thing that we see is the consequences of rebellion, that God threatens to bring about judgment for those who will not turn from their evil and wicked ways. So you see the reaching out of the heart of God, the stubbornness and rebellion of the human heart, the consequences of that rebellion, but the fourth thing that we see in the book of, in, in the, as you read through any of the prophets, is that as you turn, as you repent, God restores that people. And that is what happened in the life of the city of Nineveh. God relented from the judgment that he was going to bring upon them. And it sparked a worldwide revival that spread throughout many lands and nations of that time. So what do we do with a message like this? You know, oftentimes the word comes to us as individuals. We are a nation that is in need of revival. But I believe that we are also a people that are in need of a spiritual reawakening in our own relationships with God, that we need to have our own hearts and lives moved and touched by the word of God, that it begins to change and transform us. How is the nation changed? It begins by each one of us growing in our relationship with God, taking on more and more of the heart and character of God, reaching out with the love of God to, to tell our family and friends what Jesus Christ has done for us. And as God begins to impact our own individual lives, as family and friends begin to see that change that's taking place in our lives, maybe people, more and more people, come to church. They recognize who God is and what he's done. So it begins with us, and hopefully we begin to change and transform the church. As the church is being transformed, the church, I believe, is the hope of the nation. You know, someone once said that uh, God does not ride on the backs of donkeys and elephants. But our God is a God who's sovereign. You know, as you look towards the elections, I don't think Hillary Clinton or uh, Donald Trump are going to change our nation. But it's really believers. It lies in the heart of individual believers who put their hope and faith and trust in Christ, live a life so that it begins to change our, our families, our communities our cities, and our nation. And as we begin to see that revival taking place, God will change the hearts and lives of our nations. 
God's desire is to see a nation come back to him. And that's why the words of, of uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 are so Im uh, important to us today. Let me just close by rereading those words. These are the words of God who says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In closing, let's just take a moment to examine our own hearts and lives before the Lord. And just let me close by praying for a, a, a personal spiritual reawakening in our own hearts and lives that will touch and affect Ellis Darrell Presbyterian Church and that would move forth uh, as we seek to minister to our families and our community and that we would see our nation being changed and turning back to God. Father, once again, we thank you that you're the God of second chances, that you continue to speak to our hearts. And Father, that as you speak to our hearts, we really have two different options. We can ignore it, pay no attention to it, reject it, and face the consequences of, and the judgment of our decisions. Or we can choose to accept your word, trust and believe in you, turn from our sinful ways. And we recognize, Lord, that this is what the city of Nineveh did and there was a spiritual revival that influenced and touched the hearts and lives of many people and in many nations. So I do pray, Father, for our own relationship with you. I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, speak to us of our need for you. I pray that your word would speak to us of the love that you have for us and your desire to change and transform our lives so that we might take on more and more of the life and character of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, that through that, our family and friends would see that, that we would be able to be bold to proclaim this message, that we would see more and more people coming to Ellis Darrell Presbyterian Church to discover in new and wondrous ways your love and your grace. And Father, that we would see a spiritual reawakening here in our lives, in our church, and ultimately, Lord, it would change our nation. To that end, Lord, we lift up and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.